from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. It is now my pleasure to introduce our distinguished authors. To my right is Victor Hazan, who is an authority on Italian food and wine. He is a lifelong collaborator of Marcella Hazan, who is the queen of Italian cuisine in America. She unfortunately passed away in 2013, but her spirit and, of course, her recipes about, and ideas about Italian food will live forever on. It was Marcella Hazan, together with Victor, who brought us the classic Italian cookbook, a book that introduced Americans to classic Italian cuisine. Whenever you have a dish of classic Italian food, such as spaghetti bolognese or veal salt and bocca, you have Marcella and Victor Hazan to thank for their dedication to educating Americans on what real Italian food is and about using authentic products. Today, he will discuss his and Marcella's new book called Ingredienti. And to my left is our other author, Alessandro Frassica, who is the author of Veggie Panino. Like Victor's book, Veggie Panino focuses on the importance of good ingredients. As both of these authors would agree, all ingredients are not created equal. Your finished product can only be as good as the ingredients that went into it. By the way, we call an American, an Italian sandwich, a panini, but in Italy, panini is actually a plural. The singular is panino, and thus the book's title, Veggie Panino. Please join me in welcoming Victor Hassan and Alessandro Frassica. Victor, I understand you have a short film about Marcella Hazan. Can you yes, tell us about that? There's a short film that was taken when Marcella was given the Lifetime Achievement Award presented by the James Beard Foundation. Okay. You know, Marcella uh, picked up probably every single award available in, right. in food in her lifetime. And if uh, we have a couple of minutes, you yes. think we could... Uh, could we yeah, see that, Is that please? the one? Which master classes or is I'm sorry? There are two films. One's called Master Classes. Is that the one? It could be. It uh, could be. Why don't you start it and we'll see if it's the correct one. Start the master classes. Let's see. Right it, looks like, it looks like it. Yeah. Is there no sound with it? Is there sound? Julia Child has called her her Italian counterpart. And years back, Americans didn't know about Northern Italian cooking. And this woman, Marcella, is, is instrumental in teaching Americans about Northern Italian cooking. And she's such a kick, let me tell you. We're going to ask one of the world's most accomplished chefs to work with her magic on the most basic kind of meal. She is the remarkable Marcella Hazan, and welcome to you. Thank you. And she is known as Italy's national treasure. Even our friend, the great Julia Child, considers her a mentor in all things Italian. For more than 25 years, she's been teaching Americans about Italian cooking. You probably didn't know about pesto until Marcella told you about it. Italian cuisine is a favorite in this country, and its popularity is due in part to Marcella Hazan, who is a cookbook author, and many times she is called the godmother of Italian cooking in America. And here is the queen of Italian cooking, uh, <laughs> Marcella Hazan, who has produced this book, Essentials of Classic Italian Cooking. Marcella, your first book was a revelation for me. It was the first time I saw in print the kind of food that I was raised with, with my Italian family. But the thing that I think I will be eternally grateful to you for was when I came to study with you in Bologna in the mid-70s, you introduced me to what was to become one of the great loves of my life, the region of Emilia-Romagna. Uh, as you know, it is the main love of my life professionally. Of course, my Tuscan family still doesn't understand this. Well, Marcella, thank you. And thank you for all you've given all of us. Okay, I will have the one to make you happy now. Uh, <laughs> to the ball, yes. You're with me now, Marcello. Okay. You didn't set out to be a, a famous cook, right? I mean, you're a biochemist. No. You have two doctorates. Yes, I am. Yeah. But as you say, I'm crazy almost like this dish. 
This dish is called a pesce all'acqua pazza. And in English that translates to fish with the crazy water. Fish and crazy water. Yeah. But I'm, this is a good example of Italian cooking because we have a way of saying in Italy that has the same importance what you keep out of and what you put in. Mm -hmm. And here, actually, you put salt and pepper and lemon, that's it. That's it. Marcella arrived on the scene like a comet, and nothing was the same again. The food that we thought of as Italian turned out to be more American than Italian. For many of us, Marcella was the beginning of the real thing. La vera cucina, the true cuisine. Thank you, Marcella. When we think of pesto, we think of you, Marcella, thank you. And when we think of pork simmering in milk, a dish so succulent that one only has to think about it to taste it, we thank you. And when we think of Venezia, the place that you gave so many cooking classes to so many people, we thank you, Marcella. There are so many different Italian items that you introduced to this country. Right? Yes. It's very modest. The, the, the right, the extra version. Balsamic vinegar. Well, unfortunately, because now they use it for everything. We're drinking it like wine now. <laughs> Marcella's uh, particular gift is that she's un uncalculated, unpremeditated. She she cooks as she as she breathes, you know, as she walks. It has become a, a reflexive act on her part. She she responds to a. Uh, to an ingredient, to its color, to its shape, to its freshness or lack of it, uh, to, uh, to its bulk. And uh, out of her response come, comes a dish. And, uh, and, and it is, she is true to herself in this. And so is always true to herself. Thank you. That really gave us a great picture of Marcella and the great influence she had on Italian food. And Alessandra, I understand you have a slide that film that you'd like to show us. Can you tell us about it? Okay. Can you run that, please? Or do you want to introduce it first? Uh, in the slides, uh, for, for think, thank you to be here. It's a big pleasure to me to come from Italy and to be here to present my book, myself. Sorry for my English. Uh, it's not so, English so perfect. <laughs> but uh, yeah, this is my bottega in, uh, in Florence. It's a place where we made only panini. Because in this word panino, there are, this is our menu. Uh, there are many things to, to say. And uh, I am happy to be, to be here to, to explain something uh, Ingredients. Ingredients is the word, the word that uh, today we we talk uh, because for me this is my first one book, Il Panino, <clears throat> and I am happy that with the Panino with uh, Mortadella we have arrived here in Washington to to talk about this. This is the second one, Panino Veggie. It's only an evolution of what we do <clears throat> because. For me, it's, it's important to, to talk about this, uh, uh, the food with uh, or without uh, meat, fish. Uh, now we talk about this. It's, uh, for me, a great opportunity to, to explain this. I was saying that ingredients, it's very important because for me, everything starts from the ingredient. The quality of the ingredients, uh, uh, it's the, the first important thing. The panino, for me, is the, the tool, the container where I can do what I want to explain. This is uh, my, my philosophy. And here you can see some uh, pictures of the book. 
different receipts because uh, I think that uh, the vague word is so interesting. When we think of panino, we, th we think always salumi, prosciutto, mortadella, pecorino cheese, but it's, this is very important. But it's very important even to explain how there is a word, a green word, and uh, even the panino can be a way to, to taste, to understand this word, not only for who is vegetarian, but even for everybody, because it's very important uh, to understand what there is behind uh, this, uh, this word. In this book, there are uh, my receipts, but even different receipts of my friends, famous chef uh, in, uh, in Italy, and each of them have done one receipt for, uh, for my book, and uh, this is a great uh, honor for me to have, uh, to have this. Okay? Thank you. <laughs> Tell us about a panino and what makes it different than a, just an ordinary sandwich. Uh, no, uh, first thing, that uh, when we talk about panino, we have to talk about the bread. Because usually, when I see, even in Italy, yeah, not only <laughs> outside, we never talk about the bread. So we always talk about what we put inside, but we forget the first thing that for me is the first important thing. In the book, uh, there is uh, um, <clears throat> I want to talk about, about flour because it's very, very important to say what is warm meal, our things. I, I don't want to do a too difficult to explain, but there are some simple things uh, that uh, is very important to, to know and after, if you want to develop this, but everything starts from here. This is very, very important, uh, not only for, for the taste, okay, but even for the healthy, mm -hmm. because we cannot think that uh, when we eat something, it's only for uh, a tasting flavor, but even to, uh, to stay well, to stay better. And in the panino, it's important, the ingredient, but even the way with which you go to, to mix, to combine, Mm -hmm. these ingredients. For me, a, a panino is very, very important, uh, the harmony, the balance. I see that many people think that more things you put, the panino is better. Many people come, especially, sorry, from USA, <laughs> and they tell me, put prosciutto, <laughs> mozzarella, and they have these icons, you know, pesto, mozzarella, prosciutto, <laughs> and they want to put everything because they think that more things they put, this is better. It's not, no. The simplicity is the really uh, truth. Mm -hmm. Simplicity, to do this, you must have good quality of the ingredients. And how to go to convene them, and always I look for to find harmony and balance when you have to, to feel, to taste, the different ingredients, but they together are something more. I always say one more one is must be two, mm -hmm. not 150, <laughs> but <laughs> always. And then to add something is to became it better. This is the difference for me from a panino and a sandwich. Okay, thank you. Victor, you have a chapter in your book where Marcella writes, how I fell in love with ingredients. Can you yeah. tell us about that? Yes, yeah, so this was Marcella's introduction to, to her book. The book that we're presenting today is called Ingredienti, which is Italian for ingredients. And to, this was Marcella's summation, the last work of her life, which mm -hmm. she put her last years into. And to Marcella, the essence of cooking the whole purpose of cooking is taste. And taste depends on getting to the essence 
of the ingredient, mm -hmm. the essential quality of the ingredient. And as Alessandro was saying, the more ingredients you put into something, mm -hmm. the more muddled the taste becomes. And Marcella fell in love, in a sense, with the central character of the material that she was working with. If she was working with artichokes, you know, she would prepare a dish in which the star was the artichoke. Mm -hmm. You tasted right. the artichoke. There weren't four or five other things along with it. And to Marcella, cooking had to taste not of the person who produced it, but of the material that mm -hmm. was on, on the plate, right. as simple as possible. And Marcella became celebrated for producing recipes with only two or three ingredients. Mm -hmm. She has a, a tomato sauce with only three ingredients mm -hmm. that's become <laughs> one of the uh, most widely diffused tomato sauces mm -hmm. in, in, in the world. And the interesting thing that I saw, I saw an article in the Wall Street Journal uh, not too long ago. And it said that uh, in industrial food companies have hit on a new thing. <laughs> <laughs> food with very few ingredients, <laughs> with no more than two or three ingredients. <laughs> and I said, well, if only Marcella were around <laughs> to read this, she would enjoy it. Yes, she would set them straight, and I'm sure. Said, yes. <laughs> Okay, I, there's one place in your book where you talk about a woman who uh, talked about pasta and she said, I only use fresh. Oh, I remember the incident very well. And this happened not infrequently in Marcella's trips. Uh, uh, this was on a book tour and it was the local food editor of a city in the north. Uh, and uh, the first thing she said after greeting Marcella, she said, Marcella, I want you to know that the, the only pasta I ever use is fresh pasta, by which she meant pasta that she made herself at home. And Marcel said, oh, you poor girl, you don't know what you're missing. <laughs> because, you know, to us, yes, fresh pasta, we are from Romagna, uh, we spent much of our life in Bologna, we love tagliatelle, tortellini, lasagna, but there's so much else that is different. The pasta you buy in the stores, penne, uh, rigatoni, spaghetti, spaghettini, they have a, a, a character, a quality, they marry with sauces in a way that fresh pasta doesn't. So if you eliminate all of that, you're eliminating like 80% mm -hmm. of the flavors that Italian pastas can deliver. Okay. Alessandro, I was looking at some of the recipes in your book and um, I couldn't believe some of the things you were using like Brussels sprouts in a panino. How do you get your inspiration for doing things like that? <coughs> I see, in fact, I see that on your cover yeah. there. But <clears throat> it's very easy because I said before, for me, a panino is, is like a plate, is a receipt. I have learned many things with uh, my uh, friends chef uh, that when they came to find me, they told me, when you do one panino, do exactly like we do when we think a plate, you know? And then uh, the, the balance that they said before with uh, salty, um, bitter, the, the different flavor, no? And and then the inspiration is uh, when even I go in a restaurant, when I, I go to find a producer, I think with this ingredient, what can be the interesting combination to do this. And our menu is always traditionally, because the tradition is a treasure that we have, and we cannot uh, forget this. But I think that we must be even contemporary because <laughs> the world is changing, the, our way of life is changing. For example, in Italy, now it, we used years before to come back home to eat, we say, with the legs under the table, no? Gambe sotto il tavolino. Now, no, even we stay out, we go to eat, but 
even if I don't come back home, if I don't have my wife or my mother that cook for me. Mm -hmm. Now, this is only uh, un ricordo. We don't do this anymore. But I have to find something good, healthy, and even if it is fast the time, the quickly, and then I have to think something of good, healthy, quick, contemporary. This is, for mm -hmm. me, the world of what, what I do. And then, tradition, but to think what are the, our way of life of today, and we don't have to forget the quality, the taste, and the healthy. Mm -hmm. You have a recipe in your book for what's called a hamburgerino, <laughs> but yet it's a vegetarian panino. What is that? But it's, um, it's a game because in Italy, uh, we use to do a merenda, a snack, I like to call it merenda, because snack is not the same things in our or, uh, mind. A merenda with panino con la frittata. Panino con la frittata, appunto, omelette, no? With, but even when you are a child, you know, your mother give you these, you know, when you go for a, a, a gita, the, when the, the school, no? Mm -hmm. Give you panino con la frittata. And then I have this ancient, you know, uh, ricordo. And this, I have done this, contemporary, cioè veggie. And then I have done this game, use <coughs> one omelette, but to do a, uh, a disc, no? Mm -hmm. Like if it was an, uh, an hamburger, um, to put some, in this re recipe, you put some kale inside, and there is like an hamburger. The bread, the tomato, the cheese, uh, I use pecorino cheese, usually, the sheep cheese that we have in Tuscany, and uh, I have done uh, my own uh, ketchup with a good tomato and a uh, good red pepper, not the uh, industrial, and some salad, and this, that, so it can, is a game like if it was a really an, um, an hamburger. And then it's a way to explain, like even with a, with a joke, you can do quality. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Victor, your, uh, your book has all these various chapters about different ingredients, mm -hmm. and one, of course, is on Parmigiano-Reggiano. Um, how is that different from that stuff you buy in the green can? Oh. <laughs> the difference, again, is in the raw material. And the raw material that goes into Parmigiano Reggiano is a product of a specific environment mm -hmm. and of the reaction of milk produced by cows mm -hmm. to that environment. Milk is one of the most sensitive of products in the world. When um, uh, there was the explosion in Chernobyl and there was a fallout all over Europe and uh, foodstuffs began to be taken off the market because of uh, their exposure mm -hmm. to possible fallout. The first product in Italy mm -hmm. to be taken off the market was fresh milk. And I say this to indicate mm -hmm. how sensitive it is to the place where it is mm -hmm. produced. So the milk for Parmigiano Reggiano is limited to a few provinces in northern Italy, uh, part of them in the province of Bologna, but mostly the provinces of Parma and Modena. Mm -hmm. It is also a, a procedure that is 800 years old and hasn't been changed except for the source of heat mm -hmm. that heats up the milk in the, in the kettles. Originally the heat would have been fire, firewood, today right. the heat is better controlled, it's, it's gas. But otherwise the milk is, produced in is treated in exactly the same way. There's part of the milk comes from the evening milk and part of the milk comes from the morning mm -hmm. skim. It is cooked in these large kettles. Each kettle produces exactly as much cheese necessary mm -hmm. to make two wheels. And then those wheels are subjected to salting, to brine, 
to aging, mm -hmm. and only after three years may be called Parmigiano Reggiano. So that's a little bit different mm -hmm. from the stuff you buy in the can. Right? Yes, it's quite different. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things, of course, that Marcella wanted to do in America is educate us on Italian cuisine. And how far do you think we've come in the process? Well, I think as far as access to ingredients, the change has been enormous. Because when Marcella first started cooking in, in this country when we were married and came over, there was virtually nothing. And uh, I, through her books, through the respect and curiosity that she allows in people about Italian cooking. I think we've come today to virtually everything that is available to <coughs> Italians in Italy. Mm -hmm. Almost everything is available someplace, somewhere mm -hmm. in, this, in this country. The only thing I must say that is uh, still lacking is the quality of agriculture. In Italy, we have vegetables that have extraordinary flavor. I find it difficult in America to get that flavor mm -hmm. in the vegetables. The vegetables are either overgrown, mm -hmm. uh, uh, overwatered. Uh, they, they may be beautiful, but they don't have that intensity of flavor, that, mm -hmm. that quality that made myself fall in love right, right. with ingredients in the first place. How about you, Alessandro? Um, have you tried making any of your paninos in the United States? And what kind of success have you had with that? <laughs> no, no, I have done that. But even here, you can find good ingredients. I think that um, when I, I do something here, uh, many ingredients come from Italy, okay? But if you can find something of good here, for me, is even interesting to use what you can find in, in the place. Because for me, my philosophy is even <clears throat> what my parents told me. When you come back home, you open your dispenser, no, you know, and you always find something, mm -hmm. always. And if your creativity and uh, mm, your uh, what you feel you do together, you always find something. Mm -hmm. Then to say, here in USA, if you want, you can do a great quality of panino, if you want. What about the bread that we have here? Ah, but in USA, the flour are, there are good flour. I, I have tasted many good things. And then I, I think that we can do very good things if we want. The problem mm -hmm. is <laughs> very often people doesn't want to, to do, we see the cost, you know. It's normal that some products cost much more. For example, we talked of Parmigiano Reggiano. To do one kilo of Parmigiano Reggiano, you need 15 liters of milk. One kilo, 15 liters. Parmigiano Reggiano need when you to have 24 months of aged and even more, but you need and to have a product that stay 24 mm -hmm. months in your warehouse, it's, it has a cost. Then what I, I tell you is okay to see the price, but it's you have to do one question to yourself more if one thinks costs to less, because you have to do this question: why it costs? so it's so cheap mm -hmm. not only when it is so expensive because this is a question that is important to to do ourselves what do you think about italian restaurants here in this country uh, that was not on the program uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay you'd rather not answer that <laughs> well why don't we take some questions from the audience who has a question? Please go up to the microphone, please. Hi, my name is Carlotta, and uh, I have the privilege of being from the same hometown of Marcella, uh, that is Cesenatico, a lovely town on the Adriatic coast. 
Um, so as such, I love uh, Italian food, uh, food from Romagna. Um, so I have a question for Victor. Uh, I've tried multiple times to make piadina, but I'm not quite able to replicate the piadina I can eat in Cesanatico that I can make in Italy. So I'm really, really curious to know whether Marcella was really able to make piadina here uh, and if it, whether it was the same that she would eat in Cesenatico. Did you get oh, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't hear what food you said. Piadina. 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 She's sorry, asking if you could make, pi if Marcella made piadina here in the U.S. Marcella made piadina. Maybe piadina. we should tell people what that is. Piadina is a, is a, flat, is a flat bread. It's an unleavened bread. And in, uh, in Romagna, it uh, is uh, flattened out. And they used to be cooked on an earthenware, we called it a testo, an earthenware disc that was put directly over fire. And it, it was slightly charred. It came off the testo, and it was slightly charred, very thin, and we would either eat it with a little bit of, cut it into, uh, um, into wedges and make panini out of it, either with prosciutto, mortadella, but other panini that we made was with greens, uh, wild greens, uh, l'erbette, uh, that were wild greens that were sauteed with garlic and olive oil, you'd put it on the piadina, and that made a wonderful, uh, wonderful panino. Uh, I, um, Marcella made piadina at home, I must say, however, that on our many returns to Cesenatico, the quality of the piadina there has sadly declined. It's, it's no longer rolled out with a, a rolling pin by hand, but it is rolled out through big steel rollers. It is cooked on, on a steel griddle, and somehow the composition of it doesn't have that that flavor and that, that crackly texture that he used to have and that Marcella could get at home. Anyone else, a question? If, if, if you have the time, Guy, I don't know if you do, but that other oh, video. Let's watch a, the other video, it, yes. That's uh, very interesting because you see, uh, it's about Marcella and uh, her last uh, two weeks of life. Of course, she didn't know they were her last two weeks. The New York Times had sent an interviewer to Longboat Key, where we live, mm -hmm. to interview her and to ask if she would produce some dishes for the Times. And this was videotaped. And this was the last public view that anybody had of Marcella. Oh, and uh, it's, it's quite moving, I think. Okay, could you show that, please? The sauce uh, for the first course uh, is a very easy one. Onion, butter, and tomato, that's all. All together at the we same do, time. We don't cook the onion first. Not many spice because I, I got tired about listening that uh, uh, people think uh, that uh, the, the Italian uh, food is full of spice. They come here and run around and look at my kitchen and I say, where are your spice? <laughs> and if one is here, the other is there. <laughs> so. In a few months I will be 90. It's wow. too much. The Italians are the happiest people. You want me to do that? Yes, a letter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and 
make faces. Because in this part, put faster than this, no. Right. So I had to do this. It's very smart. I wish I had thought of that. You didn't? Yeah. Sorry. Oh. Olio. Olio pepe salad. When I married Victor, I never cooked in my life. But he had one thing that was much more production. When I did something and came right, and he was jumping from his chair and come to kiss me. So I wanted to He was to so play. happy. Well, I'm glad that you like that. It's fantastic. And it's very easy to be done. Yes, so. Anyone else have some questions? I'm Bernie. Uh, over in the Mediterranean, in, the, in general, uh, I noticed that fennel grows like wild, like weeds everywhere. But when you want to get fennel to put in your ingredients in your dishes here in the US, it's like out of sight cost-wise. And, and the question is, I'm sorry. Oh, um, for Victor, you know, his, uh, what he feels about fennel as an ingredient. What do you feel about fennel as an ingredient in the United States? Well, as a, as a vegetable, uh, it's perfectly acceptable. We, get, we can get very good fennel, finocchio. Marcella talked about it in, in the book, Ingredienti. But if you're talking about fennel, wild fennel, finocchietto, uh, there are very many varieties of wild fennel available in Italy, but they're also available here, except they don't come to the market. And in Italy, you can go to the produce market and maybe an old lady with just a few things on the store, but she will have some wild, uh, uh, some wild rucola and maybe some wild uh, uh, fennel, and that has a different purpose. That has that is for flavoring. Uh, fennel, the kind you buy in the market here, is a vegetable that you can eat either raw, or fried, or braised, or baked, and it's excellent. It's a wonderful vegetable. Do you use fennel in any of your panino? <clears throat> There is, in one recipe, there is fennel because there is a typical Sicilian recipe, the orange with fennel, mm -hmm. no? And then I have done one panino uh, using what I said before, the tradition, mm -hmm. but contemporary. I get and it. then fennel is sure a uh, nice ingredient and uh, fennel seeds uh, are inside one of the most famous uh, uh, in Saccati salami that we have uh, is finocchiona. Mm -hmm. Finocchiona, it's a carrot meat, uh, like a salami, but inside there are uh, fennel seeds, uh, and uh, this flavor is very, very interesting. Oh, may, may I add something mm -hmm. to that? Because Alessandro reminded me. One of the things that we find very peculiar is that Italian sausages in this country, by default, Italian sausage contains fennel seeds <laughs> in America. In Italy, we have places that have sausages with seeds. But you go to, to Venice or Bologna or, or Piedmont or anywhere in the north of Italy, and you have these marvelous sausages of wonderful pork. There is no fennel in them. <laughs> they, all they taste of is meat. 
Yeah. And it's very peculiar. Have you ever found a, a simple Italian pork sausage in the United States that did not contain penalty? <laughs> no. no. It's frustrating. So the problem is that when I come in USA or another country, I see some recipe uh, ingredients that we don't use. In Italy, I say, the, if I have to say one recommendation, the first thing is to look for the authenticity, it's correct, because many, many things that uh, here, many restaurants, many places sell like Italian, are not Italian, but we don't eat <laughs> this receipt. And then it's better to know less things, but true things. Mm -hmm. This is what I recommend. Who else would like to ask a question? Um, I wanted to thank Victor um, for all of the cookbooks that you and your wife did. They were very welcome um, by me and my family. Thank you for all the books you did. And, and I have enjoyed um, your son's books as well, um, Giuliano Hassan's cookbooks. And for Alessandro, I personally prefer Pecorino too. And I wonder if you could discuss your preference for that. Uh, Do you have a preference for Pecorino? Well, he said, he said that he did. <coughs> he said that he did. Well, mm, I come from Florence, Tuscany, and the cheeses that in Tuscany you produce are always sheep cheese because uh, the tradition is that many uh, pastori from Sardinia came to um, Tuscany and they, uh, we have sheep. It's difficult to find uh, cow, um, goat, uh, uh, cheese. And pecorino, there is the simple one. I like so much the fresh one, the marzolino, for example. Um, but even if it's a little bit more aged, because in this world, world there is a world. Sorry for the game <laughs> of words. And then uh, I, I love pecorino cheese, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, I'm really enjoying this. I had a question because my relatives are from the southern part of Italy, and they use some spinach and things like that. Is that common up north to put that kind of ingredient into a meal? Uh, and they combine like spinach with raisins in, in a dish that I know of. So I'm just curious. Do you know um, of any Italian dishes that combine raisins with spinach? Mm -hmm. She's from the southern, her family's from the southern part of Italy, and that's something they do down there. Do you know that? Up Italian north? dishes that combine spinach? Yeah. With raisins. With raisins? raisins? Yes. Yeah. Well, Thank you. not spinach Thank you. with raisins, but raisins are used in the cooking of Venice. Uh, and we use raisins and onions with a dish that uh, uh, uses sardines, and it is used uh, to preserve the sardines. It, it was made originally for those Venetians who were uh, traveling very far away on boats, and they would take local homemade food with them. And one of the dishes was sardines fried in vinegar and onion and raisins. And they, uh, they lasted for a very long time. But uh, raisins with vegetable, I don't know, Alessandro. I, if in Tuscany, you serve raisins with vegetables, well, like raisins spinach. We raisins is uh, <laughs> in Italian. Wheat, ah, okay, no, no, I have understood, yeah. No, in, in Sicily, we use, there is one receipt here, in one place where we use uh, uh, Moscato raisin, it's very sweet, and um, usually a typical combination is the uh, scarola, the, scarola, because it's a little bit bitter, with the raisin because a little bit sweet, and even anchovies, it's because it's salted. Mm -hmm. What I said before, now the different kinds of flavor, but that together give you harmony and balance. 
And then I have used in, in the book one without anchovies because it's veggie, but I have said this in the receipt that usually uh, scamorza cheese, it's cow cheese with uh, scarola, with uh, the resin, and um, anchovies if you want, or in the veggie, veggie version without it. It's very interesting. In south of Italy, we, we use resin, gusto uh, agrodolce, we say, mm -hmm. no? Sweet and sour. Yeah. Anyone else? Well, please thank our guests, Victor Hazan and Alessandro Frostica. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.